Welcome to our Sunday service. My name is Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Northern Lights Christian Fellowship Church of the Nazarene here in Chetwin. Let's pray. O oh Lord, help us to focus on you and your timing and not on our own agenda. We know you are aware of the difficulties of the past year and we know that you can make a way where there is no way. It's been a long haul, but your church still stands to serve you and your people. Help us to remain steadfast. Amen. Well, Easter and Pentecost have passed, but the work goes on. That Easter Sunday was 2,000 plus years ago, and the good news message still goes out to the lost and hurting world. It's been a little tougher to do this past year. Restrictions and close downs made some of the outreach events impossible. But instead of looking at what we can't do, let's be thinking of those things that we can do and do it in a safe manner. I do know that many of you are finding ways to connect with others on a restricted basis. Keep it up. This may seem like it will last forever, but it won't. There are times and seasons for all things. Just look at some of Solomon's writings in the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8 explains it well. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. <coughs> the secret to peace with God is to, under to discover, accept and appreciate God's perfect timing. The danger is we often doubt or resent God's timing. It doesn't fit into our plans and it messes up with our agendas. We dig in our heels and we race ahead without God's advice. Either movement works against us. The reason Solomon wrote this portion of scripture is to remind us God has a plan for his people. These cycles of life provide us with opportunities to learn, teach and minister to others. We've been through one year of being comparatively still. What have we learned? Did we learn to be still and trust God as we waited? Were we tempted to race ahead of his timing and see if we could fix it? Being still can be hard work, especially if you're the type of person who needs to be busy. But being too busy often deafens the sound of God's voice as he's trying to catch your attention. Consider for a moment the Israelites as they sat in Egypt for 400 years before God released them from the Egyptians. Why are we going back to the narrative of Exodus again? This is where we easily see God's hand on mankind and his love, direction, and protection. But it's also where we see a very real demonstration of human beings' response to direction, sometimes even direction from God Almighty himself. And then consider that apparently they hadn't learnt from their life in Egypt and had to wander around in the wilderness learning hard life lessons as they waited and waited and waited for God to take them into the promised land. Most of the original Israelites that left Egypt never did see that land because throughout the 40 years of wandering, they never did learn the fine art of waiting and trusting on the Lord. Over and over again, they dug in their heels and rebelled or rushed ahead of God's plan and timing. They had a habit of doing that. How often were they called a stiff-necked people? Timing is everything, or should I say God's timing is everything. I listened to a speaker this week that got me to thinking about God and his timing. By the way, I don't like to wait any more than anybody else. But this speaker made a valid point that set me thinking. Long before Moses took God's people out of Egypt, God had a plan in place. Listen to the promise God made to a man named Jacob. Genesis 28, 14 and 15. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions to the west and the east, to the north and the south. 
and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you and will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. Now at this time, Jacob was a young man and he was on the run from his brother Esau because he had tricked his brother into selling his portion of the inheritance for a pot of soup. Many years later, many kids later, Jacob returns home and on the way wrestled with an angel and had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. Jacob had many sons and the most famous of his sons was a boy named Joseph. Joseph was his father's favorite son. His jealous brothers didn't like him very much, or not at all, so they sold him to some traders who were on their way to Egypt. He was 17 years old at the time. He was sold to Potiphar, who was a soldier in Pharaoh's palace guard. Joseph remained obedient to the God of his father and earned the respect of those he had served. But once again, he finds himself in trouble and ends up in prison. But once again, he also finds himself the favorite with the prison warden. And this is where God's plan gets really exciting. Pharaoh had a dream and he didn't know what that dream meant. The cupbearer remembered that Joseph had interpreted a dream for him and one for the chief baker and he told Pharaoh about it. Joseph continued to remain faithful to God and told him that only God could interpret these dreams. God got all the credit and the Pharaoh got some wise advice on how to handle the upcoming drought that would come across the land. Joseph was put in charge of Pharaoh's court and second only to Pharaoh. Because of his position in Pharaoh's court, many nations, including his own father and brothers, were supported during the famine that spread throughout the known world. But listen to one of the last entries in this narrative in Genesis 50, verse 24. <coughs> Soon I will die, Joseph told his brothers, but God will surely come to help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. He will bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give Abraham to Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph was 110 years old. That's 93 years of waiting for a promise. Okay, that's how the Hebrew nation got into Egypt in the first place. But what would have happened if the brothers had liked Joseph? What would have happened if Joseph wasn't sold to slave traders? What would have happened if he hadn't been put in prison for a trumped up charge and gotten the opportunity to interpret Pharaoh's dream? All portions of that narrative had to be accomplished just to save the he Hebrew nation from the famine that was coming. But just as the rest of mankind come and go, so do Pharaohs. The Pharaoh who had enlisted Joseph's help died and the Egyptians forgot about the great things that Joseph had done for their nation. They saw that the Hebrew nation was thriving and their numbers were growing, so they made them slaves instead of co-workers. 400 years had passed since Joseph moved his family to Egypt and a baby named Moses appears on the scene. He's placed in a basket to save him from the death sentence on his infant life and was rescued by the Pharaoh's daughter. He's raised in a Pharaoh's court and had the benefit of the education and training that certainly helped when he led the nation out of Egypt. But he made a tragic mistake when he came to the defense of one of the Hebrew slaves and had to run for his life. We all know the story almost off by heart. He spends much of his time in exile tending sheep. I love this next portion of scripture. Exodus 3, 23 to 25. Years passed and the king died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and he knew it was time to act. God knew it was time to act. It takes time for plans to come together and God's plans are not just for the benefit of one generation or one group of people. This is part of God's plan for the good news message that we preach today. This is part of the same plan that he talked to Adam and Eve about when he expelled them from the Garden of Eden. This is an all-encompassing plan that goes even beyond our generation today. So once again, we have a reference to time. It was a time to act. God goes to another part of his plan. He gets Moses' attention through a burning bush, and after much discussion, Moses heads back to Egypt. So why the long years between Moses fleeing Egypt and going back? 
Well, Moses had led a privileged life in Egypt. Everything was done for him. But as a shepherd, he had to do everything for himself. Living the life of a shepherd and a nomad, he learned about the ways of the people he would be leading and about the life in the wilderness. They were going to be there for 40 years. Moses had been going to God's school to get him ready to free Israel from Pharaoh's grip. He was learning the lay of the land so he could direct their path. It takes a lot of convincing for the Pharaoh to let God's people go, but it finally happens. It took some pretty drastic measures, but the last one was the worst. The death of Egypt's firstborn was the tipping point. But before they left, they were given strict instructions on a new celebration they would use to remember their rescue from slavery, the Passover. But the Passover festival was more than just a remembrance of what God had done. It was a foreshadowing of what was to come, the death of the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, who would come to generations in their future. We have to remember that all this time God was preparing a group of people to be his chosen people, people who would follow him, people who would be an example to all nations around them, people who would be servants and people who would be obedient. This takes time, and in this case, a whole lot of time. Remember, they were called stiff-necked people. In other words, they didn't like to listen. We've come a long way since the days of Moses and even the days of the disciples. As we read through the Old Testament, we see some of the difficulties the nation of Israel had merely because of their unwillingness to listen. We read through the New Testament, and over and over again, Paul writes about trusting God and not being afraid. Now here we sit in the year 2021. Over and over again, we've been told to sit still and wait. We wonder, wait for what? A miracle to happen? A sudden end of the pandemic? An opportunity to visit friends and family? All of these things are important. An opportunity to meet with fellow believers and praise the Lord for the work he has done? I don't know if what I'm going to say next will be an encouragement or a discouragement, but here I go. It's been one year and a half. It hasn't been 400 or 40. <coughs> don't be discouraged, but think about it. I never felt that this was going to be an easy ride and in a few months it would be over. I've always felt that this is one of those many things that is in God's timing. There are too many unknowns in the equation to be accidental. I do know that God's hand has been on all of us all the way through this difficulty. And while it hasn't been easy or comfortable, he has promised he will never leave us or forsake us. I also know that there have been some wonderful opportunities that have been afforded to us that we would never have thought of before as being ministry. One of those is demonstrated by the fact that you watch these on Chet TV. In other words, God's messages are getting out to more and more people than we could ever reach in our local churches. Is it ideal? No, but it's a solution for the moment, and God blesses each opportunity that's taken. So let's really be thinking carefully about our responses to the world around us. What messages are we sending to the world? Do the words we say, our actions show that we are God's people who have been called by His name? Do people see God's love in us, or are we stiff-necked trying to do this on our own and thinking we have a better idea? Continue to be steadfast in your faith. Continue to trust God in His timing. Continue to love each other and forgive where forgiveness is needed and mercy and grace where mercy and grace is required. Continue to pray for God's guidance. He wants to hear from you. And remember, this is only for a season. As the seasons change, so will this. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Ephesians 3, 18-19. God bless you all.